Hawkins Glen International Raceway here in upstate New York, just south of the village of Watkins Glen, New York, and on the edge of Seneca Lake, plays host to round two of the GT2 Season 2 Championship here on RCI TV. Round one last week at Bathurst was a very fast and furious affair with drivers trying to schedule their pit stops accordingly and also not have accidents coming down the Conrad into the chase. Today, the problems will be brand new, a high speed, high downforce sort of racetrack with tires that will be screaming for any reprieve. Hello everybody and welcome. I'm Jesse Lee joined by John Dalton tonight with Stewie behind the cameras. Qualifying just about getting ready to get underway. But John, before we get to that point, this is Watkins Glen. We're in New York. It's an 11 turn road course. It tortures tires. 
Yeah, for sure, Jesse, and welcome everybody to the broadcast. Um, certainly is a tricky track. I mean, you've got the the likes of, of course, the outer loop turn five. It's a very long, drawn out right hander, almost a kind of double apex corner, and then of course the uh, high load corner just after the uh, the shoot. And then, of course, towards the end of the lap, you've got turn 10, turn 11 again, very hard on the tyres. As we uh, ride on board here, I believe this is uh, possibly Grim Lilith or Jordan Daly, one of the two Audis uh, we've got going in the series at the moment. And uh, towards the uh, steering wheel, of course, uh, just above TC off, Jesse, on the Audi. We know the GT3 can be a bit of a bit of a handful as Grim there wrestles it through the uh, bus stop or the inner loop. And this is turn five that we were talking about, of course, the outer loop. It just goes on forever jess you can already see the car wanting to wash wide and uh it's just loading up that front left pirelli so so much and of course over the uh, one hour race it's going to be you know like you say jesse absolutely torturous on these pirellis well it's funny you mentioned that uh, left side tire uh, the left side tires wearing extremely here in practice thus far i talked to a couple of the drivers in the garage prior to qualifying kicking off here today and a all of them Audi drivers, funnily enough, but they all mention the same thing is that uh, the left sides are burning on this car. They're getting super hot. That's not conducive to grip, and that will become a problem. Look for this. This is turn nine, folks. This is where the boot rejoins the short course. That will be headache corner for a lot of drivers as the camber falls away and the wall confines are not very inviting at all. In turn 11, you can lose a lot of time in this particular section of the racetrack for reasons right like that the wall is always closer than it may appear but that's a lap around Watkins Glen Grim Lilith sets our first representative time it was a 45 Jordan Daly who was quickest in practice that's a 44 6. Yeah two Audis looking very dominant dom, dominant sorry uh, once again today again had a very good run at uh, Bathurst uh, if I'm not mistaken uh, last time out and you know great showing put on by both of them I believe we even had the uh, the two teammates essentially uh, battling their way through the race, just having a bit of fun as they kind of fought, I think it was for second and third, as of course Christopher Strepp and the man also on the front row provisionally at the moment in the KTM kind of ran away from the race in the number 747, the KTM looking very settled indeed at the mountain. Andy Bourbon's Maserati up in the contention as well, P3. Uh, Roland in P4 and our very own Ted Ed was in P5. But of course, Jesse, the uh, GT2s, I believe, don't have tire blankets. So again, these aren't going to be, you know, accurate representative times as Jordan Daly finds the wall at turn six, bounces off it. That's going to be an invalid lap time more than likely. Uh, possibly a trip back to the pits for him as well. But no tire blankets. So again, these times aren't really representative. We're going to start seeing, uh, you know, a lot of the faster times towards the uh, latter half of the qualifying. Of course, fuel load comes down, tire temperatures go up. Makes a good recipe for those hot laps. Yeah, if you're wondering what the screen freeze was, that wasn't a uh, graphical error. That's what happens when a car joins the session late. There's nothing that keeps them from joining late, of course, but uh, most of the drivers, uh, a gentlemanly agreement that you'll join prior to qualifying starting because it does freeze the screen a little bit with custom liveries in play. With that out of the way, Daly, Vestrepin, Boardman, the top three cars. Boardman has a little bit of work to do, more than half a second back on the first couple of cars, but is on a flyer right here as the Grease Weasel 69 will come to the line. There's a wave yellow for a car in turn one, but it is not going to hamper this lap. A 44.825 takes them to the front row. Yeah, provisionally on the front row, of course. We've still got some big names in the field just behind. They were trying to find their feet, of course. Uh, Christopher Streppen, one of them. Raphael Huell, another one. Les Stevenson can be very quick in his own right as well. And, of course, from Lilith, slightly out of contention in P8. Spoke earlier on the broadcast to uh, Peter Varga just before we went live. Uh, joined us in the booth for a few words. And quite confident uh, was his demeanor, I'd, I'd say, Jesse. Very, you know, a lot of faith in the Maserati here at this circuit and of course Andy Boardman provisionally on the front row of the grid so definitely a good car on the side of the BOP I'd say. Yeah, he didn't sound like a man that was scared of the challenge of Watkins Glen this is a track that'll chew you up and spit you out and we've already seen that a little bit in qualifying here and they're not even racing each other yet but Peter Varga just like you say seemed absolutely unfazed for Team Monkey Racing the car currently P3 in their class two classes by the way Pro and Silver. Pro has a white number background. Silver, of course, has a gray numbered background. All the cars are GT2 cars, but they are racing for points in their championship only. 
and not overall glory. So passing cars in your own class will get you more points. And one of the brave fellows in the race has got to be Teixeira in the Porsche, John. Yeah, we spoke last time, didn't we, at Bathurst, how he uh, managed to see that car all the way to the end. The number uh, triple one currently down in P18, uh, P5, I believe, uh, for the silver running. But the only driver to pick the Porsche, nobody picking the uh, the 991.2 and the only driver to pick the 935, the majority of the field today, uh, of course, in KTM's, Maserati's, a couple of Audis, a couple of Mercedes. Uh, thrown into the mix as well officially uh from the first round 38 gt2 cars signed up uh, 15 of those were ktms nine audis eight maseratis and five mercedes and like you said jesse a very brave bernardo Teixeira in the 935 it's been a wild ride so far this could be a track where they may be able to get some traction here it's a very fast-paced racetrack and how about this? A little bit of racing for you. Just trying to get to the line. Robbie Kelly, the TIG Game 25, going to pull off of the racetrack. Might have got a little bit of a slipstream assistance there coming to the line. You never can tell. That does come into play a little bit on some of these longer straights here at Watkins Glen. We haven't talked about the weather, but I feel like we should. Been overcast for the entirety of practice and qualifying thus far, but that hasn't dampened the heat. 30 degrees C, the track temp, 28 ambient. It is pretty darn warm, I'll say, for this part of New York. And beyond that, that is not going to help those tire issues that we heard the drivers grumbling about. Yeah, of course, the uh, the more heat down on the circuit, the more heat that's going to essentially transfer through the Pirelli rubber into the tire. It's, you know, it's going to be a, a hellish hour, I would say. And, of course, with the, uh, the mandatory pit stop, uh, enforced for all drivers a 20 minute pit window so slightly smaller than usual tonight we're going to see a very chaotic pit lane so at Bathurst it was essentially a five lap window uh, to come down the lane and it's not too dissimilar here maybe six laps at most for the 144.687 being your top time currently set by Jordan Daly so going to be a, a busy pit lane uh, one liter of fuel must be added but it's a fixed refueling time Jesse so no matter if you take one liter two liters 100 liters it's still going to cost you 25 seconds of standstill meaning of course the uh, fresh set of pirellis will only cost an additional five seconds and uh, with the track temperature here tonight i think that's going to be a very viable strategy for the drivers yeah, it really will be it's going to be interesting some of the drivers at bathurst sort of weaponized their pit stops others had to come in based on necessity we had a significant amount of incidents coming down conrad and through the chase that led to them exiting to stage left down the pit lane that's also a possibility here coming back onto the short course it's very possible that cars can tangle and we've seen that throughout the history of this race qualifying entering its final five minutes everybody still fighting over their positions and like normal here john very close on the times we're talking less than a tenth between positions right now at very small margins indeed i mean the top 10 covered by just over a second and i mean the the next and the next eight cars even covered by again just a second so you've got 18 cars within two seconds or so of each other and it's not like a massive margin but of course two seconds make a small mistake on the circuit and suddenly your rivals can be on top of you and we certainly saw that of course last time out at mount panorama and I'm at the moment relatively kind of unfazed towards the top of the board. I mean, Jordan Daly still your provisional pole sitter chased by Andy Gorman. Christopher Streppen still just can't make that KTM work here, it seems, to nab that top spot. It's going to be certainly a closer race than we saw last week, of course. Uh, Christopher Streppen got off to a great start and uh, managed to uh, kind of streak away from the pack relatively unfazed. Lots of clear air, navigated traffic very well, but seems like he might have a fight on his hands this week from Andy Borman and Jordan Daly and Mo Plate just behind as well. We saw Mo Plate in the uh, in the Monday series, the GT4 and the TCX again in an Audi R8. And uh, he did very well indeed, uh, finishing just inside the top 10 of GT4. So throwing himself towards the front of the grid. Mo Plate, Jesse, be a driver to watch for this race. Could very well be. Plate's been in a couple of positions in the last couple of seasons that I've called with him in it where You've just not been able to grab hold of destiny a little bit, but they've certainly put themselves in the correct position. They just got to figure out how to finish off 
those scenarios. Kevin Boss comes across the line and does improve. They were more than seven seconds off the pace. This is getting incredibly close to the 107% rule. Not that we have one of those, but uh, they've sort of rectified that. They went three seconds, the better part of, quicker on that lap. That'll make them feel a lot better. Alexander in the 14 looking to do the very same, but I wonder if this lap may have been impeded a little bit. We'll see across the line, and it uh, was invalidated anyway but so we don't have a 107 percent rule around here but the reason i bring that up is with a fast track like watkins Glen, it becomes a bit of a problem if you're so much off the pace and uh, there's no real way to get out from behind somebody especially through the s's through the carousel and of course heel and toe very difficult to judge as well but uh, by and large everybody within somewhat of a safe window andy boardman has gone p2 in the number 69 maserati a little less than one and a half tenths off of Daly's overall time, still sitting at a 44,687. Still a very respectable time, isn't it? Nobody really coming close at the moment. Running on board with Raphael Huel through the uh, kind of middle part of the lap in the KTM. It was amazingly settled coming through the bus stop. Lots of curb usage. KTM looked relatively unfazed on the uh, steering wheel movement and looks even more stable as he comes over the top of the boot into Hill. This is turn eight. Essentially, again, be very careful on the uh, track limits on exits. Very easy for racing drivers to get greedy and take a little bit too much. And there you go, Jesse. I was going to say, the tricky nature of turn nine, as you said earlier on in the broadcast, Raphael Huel there with a big armful of opposite lock, very well saved and held. I fear that is going to hamper his lap time somewhat. As we ride on board now, Christoph for strap and lights and blades. PC off on the steering wheel. You see the little yellow icon in the bottom left-hand side, of course, uh, different to Raphael Huel, who of course was using some level of TC. Let's see how Christopher Streppen now takes the same sequence of corners that Raphael Huel has just got loads of oversteer in. Again, third gear through here. I think Raphael Huel was in second, so uh, Christopher Streppen really using the, uh, the turbo of the car to get the car off the corner and much more calm and stable through turn nine. A little wiggle on the exit, but very well held in to the corner, dipping the wheel in the grass as he runs up to turn 10. Again, another corner for track limits here. Got to be very careful, especially if you're following a pack in dirty air and see the front end there wash away as he comes through turn 11 towards the line. Christopher Streppen, is it going to be enough to take pole position? It's not. He's closed the gap to Andy Boardman, though. So again, looking very promising indeed. Cross the line, just about 40 seconds to go. So he's going to have another stab at it. One last shot for the Belgian driver. Can he take the pole position, though, Jesse? I don't know about that. Daly's time's really nice, but what Christoph Streppen did right there at that lap time is put themselves in genuine contention. I don't think you can win from three to four tenths back like some of the other cars, but within a couple of tenths, yeah, that's absolutely nothing. That's wiggling off of the corner. We saw a little bit of that coming through back onto the short course from some of the cars in turn nine a little while ago. And that's all it is. That's a couple of tenths, and that is the difference. If you can get up there and put pressure on the leader in the race, this is a racetrack where that's very prevalent, then you can make that work. Boardman comes across the line. One of the first finishers of qualifying. No improvement there. Still second on the front row. It's like Tigris and Racer have come through as well. Les Stevenson has eclipsed Kerrigan for the provisional pole in the silver class. And Robbie Kelly, one of the cars still out there on the race course, making their presence known. Les Stevenson, back to my point, they have already come into pit lane voluntarily. They'll take no further part. They do have somewhat of a healthy lead back to Kerrigan and Critic. That's yeah, a good point you make there about, of course, Les Stevenson. Little gap as well. They've got a pro car between themselves and Kerrigan. So, again, that's not going to be for overall points, but Kerrigan is going to have to get past the number 48 before, of course, he can have a, a stab at Les Stevenson, essentially, on that one. Christopher Streppen's last lap was abandoned prematurely, skipped back to the pit lane, and an observation from our broadcaster lost 0.15 in the last couple of turns, so that could have potentially been a pole time as Ted Edwards... Good improvement there with a 145 flat nearly as he comes across the line. Jumps from ninth to fifth position. That is a few rows forward on the grid for the number eight race Ventura entry. Yeah, I talked to Ted Edwards prior to the race as well, and he was in the Audi camp that was complaining about the left side tires of the car. He said that I might as well pray for him, but I don't think he needs any prayers. He's doing a really good job up into P5 
a little bit of confidence there shot in the arm as qualifying comes to an end here today and with a couple of positions changing hands here's what it looks like results daily and boardman will line up on the front row the strepin and plate in the second edwards and roland in the third your pole sitter in silver is les stevenson over callum kerrigan critic is third and i believe you're gonna have gore fox in fourth place and varga in fifth in the silver class yeah some very big names in the uh in the front row of the grid of course jordan daly andy boardman we've seen them clash quite a lot haven't we in the rci leagues that they've entered uh, a few bits of chat there down the uh, right hand side of the screen as well uh, say Mike Jones there, bottom right hand side, watching the speed down the straight on the Mercedes is terrifying. So uh, keep your eye on Miguel Martins, your highest placed Mercedes currently uh, in P14. But Jesse Lee, we do have some standings coming at us uh, in the form of, uh, by the looks of it. Starting off with the Silver Championship, here is how they finished round number one or thereabouts, though uh, this doesn't look particularly correct. Kevin Voss is on 65, Jones on 58, Honda Haga on 53, Kerrigan on 48, Varga has 47, Fox on 41, Teixeira has 40 championship points, Matt Critic on 34, Bubbins has 31, and Whittle has 8. Outside the top 10, Asil has 25, Villas Moss on 23, Abiza Racer has 20 championship points. Everyone else you see here with a zero has not scored points in round one or has joined the series in season and is still active. Anyone with a dash tired from the championship. Well, moving swiftly on from silver to the pro field, John Dalton, you want to take us through it? Yeah, certainly so. I mean, Christopher Strepan at the top of the board, as expected, 72 points to his name, a very Healthy lead, of course, after the race win, pole position, and the fastest lap. So kind of triple, can we say triple points near enough on 72. Grim Lilith on 58. Aaron Jackson on 53, of course, promoted from silver to pro. Remember last time, dominated the uh, the pro field and all of the silvers. Uh, Rybecki on 48. Miguel Martins on 44. Ted Edwards on 40. Andy Boardman off to a healthy start on 37. Raphael Huell with 34, Richard Withel on 31, and Emo Plate on 28. Round out your top 10 in pro. Very big names there that we know very well here, so watching those guys clash is going to be very exciting indeed. Robbie Kelly on 25, Fossey Tigris on 23, Norris on 21, Danak Kalmari on 19, and Maxime Roland on 17. Jordan Daly yet to score, of course, alongside Parker Olsen with a uh, double sign up there, which is a bit of a bug in the championship standings. But again, plenty of good names there, Jesse Lee. Jordan Daly down in P16, of course, after the, uh, the Mount Panorama round didn't quite go his way. So he's going to be wanting to uh, take a very strong finish here today at Watkins Glen, I'd say. Yeah, it certainly is. If you have momentum coming into round number two, especially if you did well at Mount Panorama, you were able to avoid the tight confines. You were able to avoid the other cars. You executed your pit stop and you got a great finish. You're going to want to keep that momentum up because you're already in good standing in comparison to a lot of the cars you're racing against. So there's no reason to let off the gas either literally or figuratively in this race. And I've just clocked why I thought those standings looked a bit odd. Of course, post-race stewarding has taken effect in the past seven days, and that has jumbled up the finishing order of some of the cars. So that's why it looked to me like they were out of place because that's not where I remember them crossing the line. But of course, post-race penalties have been totted up, and those are the official results of round number one and by proxy, the championship point. John Dalton, a lot of cars here at Watkins Glen today. It's 28 to 30, some cars. It's a track that is very quick, but there's really, around most of these turns, just one single line that's the quick one. They're not gonna get the single file quite quickly. What's your tips to get through the S's and through the bus stop for lap number one? Yeah, like you say, Jess, it's a pretty uh, it's a pretty single file, isn't it, uh, race circuit when you, when you look at it and look at the bigger picture. There's lots of long braking zones into certain corners, of course. Uh, you're very brave you can attempt to move into the bus stop of course the outer loop no no real passing place there it's going to be the inside line 
the way around, of course. Coming off uh, down into shoot, might get a good run, might be able to make a pass there and equally into toe and heel as well. Turn nine, you can get a good run off the hill, certainly a good passing place as well. And again, turn 10, you'd be very brave to try something and the final corner especially brave to try something. But you never know on this circuit, absolutely anything can happen in racing as we know all too well. But certainly is going to be key to getting into single file. Of course, turn one, the uh, typical pinch point again, GT2s, no tyre blankets on these, so Pirellis are going to be quite cold. Brakes aren't going to be quite up to temperature coming in to turn one. So again, have to take the cautious approach. Fingers crossed you can single yourselves out by the time we get, of course, to the bus stop or the uh, the inner loop, should we say, uh, at the end of the back straight. But Jesse, cast your mind back a while ago. Uh, a few of us jumped on to, uh, to LFM, ran a few races, missed the horizontal there aka Ash Bibby in the KTM. Um, do you remember our run through turns two, three, and four, Jesse? Yeah, I, I sure do. I remember how badly that worked out for everybody except Jordan Daly, who was able to drive. Well, actually, no, Daly was involved in it. Who was it that made it through? It was, that, it, it was uh, Kevin you? Boss. Or Kevin it was Boss. Kevin Boss with a Fast oh, and Furious yes. move where the uh, almost uh, threaded the needle, should we say, through the, uh, the carnage that ensued. I thought it was Daly, but I remember Daly and I had a race to see who could drive their broken, crumpled cars back to pit lane the quickest. Uh, we were uh, giggling a little bit. So uh, either way, uh, it could happen to anybody is the point that we're making here. It was a blind mistake, and it happened about five or six cars in front of us, but we were all completely helpless and hopeless to avoid the incident. That is the way it goes. Well, unless your name's Kevin Boss, who drove through it in his Camaro, as I recall, was able to finish the race appropriately. Sometimes it's more about luck than skill. Don't tell drivers that. But when it comes to avoiding accidents, that's just the harsh truth. I will say the pinch point, the more likely bottleneck will be that bus stop that we just came through right about now. The carousel's also dangerous. If a car's diving down to the inside, trying to make a move, it's easy to wash out and have contact as well. There's really no safe place around this course. Yeah, it's, it's really, you know, it's almost like Alton Park where we were Monday. It's a very kind of single line racetrack. A couple of passing opportunities and even more passing opportunities if you're very, very brave coming into some of these corners. But I don't think all drivers will uh, yeah. as brave, should we say, early on in the season, of course. If you can get some good points now early on in the game, it's going to save you kind of panicking once the uh, calendar, of course, gets to the end. And of course, just to remind you of the calendar, it's a weekly race every Friday here. Uh, next week, we head to Silverstone for round three. Uh, round four is going to be held at the Nürburgring Nordschleife. So that's going to be super interesting to see purely GT2 cars going around the circuit as opposed to all the multi-class GT3 stuff we've been seeing very recently. Short hop back to uh, Blighty again for round five at Donington. Uh, that's May 3rd before we, of course, round off the season on May 10th at Spa. So lots of very fast tracks there, Jesse, of course. Flowing Natures, Watkins Glen, most similar to Silverstone. Silverstone, again, a few a few more high-speed sections, should we say, a, a little bit flatter, uh, less elevation. But Nürburgring is going to be a very interesting one indeed for these guys. Yeah, this is a very tense moment as we come back around the turns 9 and 10. There's 11 turns on the racetrack. The track, of course, goes clockwise. The weather has persisted. It's very overcast here. Ominous, one would say. One hour of racing on the cards and a mandatory pit stop inside the pit window to come. But for now, the green flag is about to fall. 31 degrees. Track temp, it's gotten a little bit warmer on the track 28 ambient no real wind to speak of and that's typically good news for weather meaning that uh, there is no weather moving in it's just overcast and very cloudy 60 minutes to go a lot of nervous drivers a lot of strategy to play out here in the first couple of laps on what you do and what you don't do john dalton let's get it yeah let's get it indeed of course waiting for the green flag to drop cars of course two by two it's simply a very long hold here at Watkins Glen and we go green Jordan Daly off to an excellent start jumps ahead of Andy Boardman now coming in into turn one Christopher Streppen covering off the outside almost trying to force the Maserati to the higher line of the corner knowing the camber of course will suck you around everybody looks like they've got through safely it tends to be the uh, the S's where it all kicks off of course as cars go two by two 
up the hill through turns two, three, and four becoming before coming on to the back straight away and of course that famous run down to the bus stop where everybody starts jostling and jinking for position trying to find anything they can on their rivals to get themselves ahead coming into the bus stop be careful of the armco on the inside it can be really lethal if you do hit that you kind of pinball yourself back across the track we've got a ktm very slow indeed held on quite well and uh, even some of the audi r8 in the background they're cutting up the inside taking avoiding action and uh, I think all bar one car that could have been a pit lane starter, Jesse, the 727, we saw a car disappear on our grid walk, but everybody looks like they've got through safely, commentator's curse touchwood here. Yeah, there was definitely a couple of stack ups in turn number one, but they just about got it sorted out. And I believe that 727 that you speak of, that's Luis Villas Moss, I believe they did start from the pit lane but based on how far back they are, that might've been accidental it could have been on purpose as well we've seen it both but these drivers are still all over each other you saw that one ktl made a little bit of a mistake ended up jumping the exit curve of the bus stop chicane and three or four cars immediately jumped on them it goes back to what we were talking about in qualifying where you make a little bit of a mistake three tenths are gone off of the clock and that's just how easy it can happen and when you get racing side by side here it's even worse because you're hemorrhaging time because there really is only one line but they get it sorted before turn 11 there and they end up single file and that's probably at the interest of both drivers huge passing opportunity down into turn one who can break the latest nobody here as they get back to single file space afforded by most of the drivers here early john yeah, I'm very surprised to see a lot of these drivers kind of, you know, I wouldn't say giving up space, but certainly being more cautious than they usually would. Of course, we've seen GT3, GT4 here being absolutely more chaotic. And here we go. This is what Mike Jones was talking about in the in-game chat. Look at the speed of the Mercedes as it closes up. That's Miguel Martins here behind Norris in the number 48. And just the, the game there, Jesse, it was like a completely different machine behind the Maserati. Yeah, some of these cars, they have top end, others have better turn in ability. That will be definitely on display at a racetrack like this. And all oh, porpoising, bouncing off the turn. That is not advantageous to grip. And that has allowed a car to get underneath them as I believe Roland here or Grim Lilith, one of the two, I can't quite see that we were watching with Grim Lilith. That was Roland in the background, looking to make the move there, unable to get it done, Grim Lilith in seventh place fighting to stay in their position with their very interesting control method they use a controller a bog standard controller not a wheel they're racing inside the top 10 of the pro field yeah we say this every broadcast don't we that grim is in but it's still astonishing how they can race with a controller in a you know a field bear in mind some of these guys thousands of pounds on sim rigs direct drive wheels ultra wide monitors triple wide you know triple screens the whole shebang and grin lilith is out here on a controller hustling everybody keeping them very honest inside the top 10 had an even better run than what we're seeing at the moment at mount panorama so yeah fantastic to see you know you don't need professional gear you don't need the most expensive gear to enjoy acc you can still be really competitive on you know the baseline hardware I remember in the early days um i believe uh, it was Hassini, uh, possibly, correct me if I'm wrong, Jesse, used to race on a G25 and an old, like, LCD, quite small monitor on a desk that was, you know, not ideal for the conditions, but even they were putting it to the eSports stars, and, you know, it's it's not about the hardware anymore. You know, it's, it's purely about raw talent, and some of these people, you know, have either got it or you haven't, let's say, Jesse. Speaking of raw talent, Martin Lawrence did the same thing, was beating eSports pros on a G25 back in 2020 on this very sim so there you go hardware is great but talent is quite another well speaking of talent it's all gone wrong for kevin boss the wheelie slow number 31 has been given a drive-through penalty and i didn't see that off the start so it could have been a start infraction but it's more likely that they've had a bang bang play with a uh, off-track experience meaning that they got done for cutting the track while exiting the track and rejoining the track. And that is very unfortunate. I believe we've seen that here almost more than anywhere else. Normally it only registers as a single contact when something like that happens, or not a contact, a single off track. 
but you can get done both ways, especially if you're coming through a, a chicane, for instance, where you're off in the entry, you're off in the exit, and that may have been three quick ones in a row for Kevin Boss, who's just served a drive through penalty. Yeah, myself and Stewie being a, a bit observant, I think uh, Kevin did pick that up for a uh, start start infraction uh, because Ooh. he did come out of turn one uh, with a drive through penalty. So, and, oh, okay. contact oh, big crash. in the background. That's Robbie Kelly. Oh, this is going to be bad. Number 71. That's going to be very bad indeed as a few more cars get stacked up in it. Miguel Martins comes barreling in. This is the big one. Peter Varga just about manages to draw up in time. I beat the racer very slow indeed, but there's four, five, maybe even six cars Les involved. Les Stevenson, your in leader in the silver class, involved in it. Second place in the silver class. Class also involved in it. This is Critic, and th this is just a view from them. We're, we're going further back in the field. Absolutely nothing anyone could do. A rolling roadblock, as it were, as they exit the S's section. We talked about how John Dalton and me had this exact experience as more cars squeeze their way through. Guar Fox gets away with it. John Dalton and I were telling the cautionary tale that we were involved in a very similar incident here. With earlier on and uh, that is just unfortunate that has taken out both the leaders in the silver class yeah as we were saying earlier weren't we on the grid jesse anything can happen here at watkins glen and although it looked like a relatively calm start it is certainly kicked off already that promotes ibiza racer as your silver leader predominantly as miguel uh, this is miguel martins actually this isn't uh, norris norris is to the right hand side uh, in the maserati but miguel martins coming through trying to check up but the sheer speed of course that you carry in these gt2s they're a much faster uh, on power than a gt3 car less downforce though so it does kind of rely more on the driver as we see bernardo texture they're corner. sliding through turn 10 almost like four wheel drifting like an old oh, school man. rally car but fantastic scenes there from the triple one but back to my point in question of course it's you know it's one of those things you come in with such a huge amount of speed coming out of turn one of course from where Bernard, uh, Bruno Texera is right now obviously steps on the power and you don't come off the power Jesse until you're at the bus stop braking mm. so of course come over the hill here 230 240 kph and all of a sudden you've got cars scattered across the circuit and you know you can't you can react but you're not going to stop this car out of time unfortunately no you're really not oh and it's going to be an accident here in the bus stop tigers is going to get in the back of keith withel and that's going to cause a local yellow flag as tigers lets off the throttle they're going to break in the grass there and hope that Withel can get by what happened here. Oh, just a little bit too far left over the grass. Tigress into Withel, and that's all she wrote. Yeah, very unfortunate indeed. And like we said, it's a very brave move to try and pull something off in the bus stop. And of course, nine times out of 10, it does go wrong. It relies on two drivers working together. One of them may be yielding and making it ever so slightly easier, breaking a little bit earlier, or, you know, just carrying less speed into the corner. And of course, when two drivers meet loggerheads and don't want to yield, could be the result of that one. Peter Varga making a pass for the silver lead on Ibiza Racer, covering off into turn nine as they come up the hill. Didn't want that Mercedes to do the old switchback, the old up and under and get past. As we see uh, Ibiza Racer's brake lights there uh, blinking. Comes out the corner. I wonder if he's got maybe a sticky pedal uh, on his sim rig setup and uh, it could possibly be by the Mercedes. Now there's uh, just out of this corner. No brake lights flashing there, so very strange indeed. Uh, we'll have to keep an eye on that one as the race progresses. But, you know, the Silver League, Jesse, turned on its head in the uh, tip of two corners, pretty much. Well, the race start, John, was just way too smooth. It was way too organized and clean. You knew something eventually like that was going to happen. It's unfortunate, but everybody got into a line. Everybody was so compact, and all it takes is one little incident in the wrong place, and it was going to kick off, and that's exactly what happened. The sort of downside of that is it broke up a little bit of the pack the positive side of that is that it broke up the pack a little bit yin and yang if you will and now everyone's into a little pocket before they were all lying astern several cars into the pit lane to the attention of other teams now this will not count as their required pit stop the pit stop uh, window isn't even open yet this is all damage done by the incidents out there on the race course that they are having to repair. Meanwhile, with all of this going on with Peter Varga taking the lead in the silver class over Racer, that brings Mike Jones into third place in that category. 
as well. Daly leads overall over Boardman and Vestrepin. Those two cars, Boardman and Vestrepin anyway, quite close. I've noticed that uh, Maxine Roland has gotten by Kelly for the seventh place position, putting pressure on Grim Lilith. Aaron Jackson making a move there for 12th place. Of course, that doesn't pay any position points, but that does get them a little bit closer to Miguel Martins, a driver who they are racing against. And just looking at Racer's car, P2 in silver, that Rello colored Mercedes, that car doesn't look right to me, John. It looks like it's a bit damaged. Yeah, potentially could be. I mean, we did see Ibiza Racer, of course, come steaming through uh, the incident after their pit lane start. Uh, of course, maybe, uh, maybe uh, no, no, it wasn't Ibiza Racer, sorry. It was Villas Mass in the similar color car starting from the pit lane. But Ibiza Racer, of course, did come steaming through the accident. And I think we're going to catch a play possibly here of how they ended up coming through. Of course, uh, white flags shown ahead. And uh, you can already see there, chaos erupts. And I managed to check up, actually. So. Know if the damage was caused from that or maybe by an earlier incident we just haven't caught on the broadcast. Meanwhile, Gore Fox rising up the back of Texiera, probably going to be quite frustrated in the KTM. Of course, the uh, the cornering power of that thing compared to the 935 Porsche ahead is, is far superior on paper. As we see uh, Texiera there sliding a little bit more. Gore Fox, of course, closing up the gap, getting into the wake of the 935. And of course, with them, they bring Olsen in the number 74 just behind there. So uh, Texture is going to almost be seeing double in the rearview mirror when he looks back, but bending off the pressure very nicely indeed. But that Porsche certainly sliding through these corners, Jesse, almost like an old school race car. Well, it has the markings of an old school race car, or the bodywork, I should say, of an old school race car, and it's certainly driving like one today. Look at that car wash out. It's throwing the boat a little bit is that Porsche to get it off the corners. And we talked to Teixeira and we said, point blank that's a brave pick isn't it to share a sheepishly said yeah it sure is but uh you know they're out here racing it and they're in a well currently a top five position in their class and making it look uh, somewhat viable now a lot of drivers would shy away from that because of the sort of difficulty of the car the same way a lot of drivers wouldn't drive the gt4 maserati for its lacking ability. But some drivers, they love that extra little bit of challenge. And as far as long as I've known Bruno Teixeira, they have never shied away from a challenge. Yeah, some drivers absolutely, of course, out here racing for fun rather than for points and fame and championship titles, should we say. And one of the drivers, of course, that doesn't shy away from the Maserati, uh, Nikolai uh, Polyakov, uh, cast your mind back, of course, to the One Make Series, ran absolutely dominated that. And I think briefly in one of the GT4 championships uh, soon after, came back for a kind of uh, a one-night homage. He did, yeah. a one-night homage to the Maserati and still wiped the floor with everybody else in the modern-day machinery, of course, with ABS and TC. As we see uh, Aaron Jackson there, the end of the move on Peter Varga coming through the uh, bus stop. Uh, Varga there just overcooking and Jackson slamming on the brakes a little bit more to tighten the car up for the exit to navigate their way through the number 508. So from Jackson now up into P11. Of course, that's not going to be for championship position or points, should we say. Uh, he's going to have to get through, of course, the uh, back of Miguel Martins uh, before he'll see any gain in points. Meanwhile, this fight is still going on, isn't it? Grim Lilith uh, fending off Maxime Roland and, of course, Robbie Kelly uh, just behind as well after, of course, Robbie Kelly's uh, scary moment earlier on with a big sideways as well. And Lilith all over the exit curve there. Got to be careful not picking up track limits. You can see there, Maxime Roland's car washing a little bit up the uh, up the racetrack as they come through in the dirty air. Meanwhile, in the background, Jordan Bubbins trying to stay clear of uh, Vossi Tigris, I think that is coming back through. Of course, sensible, uh, sensible driving there uh, from the number 65. Letting the number 15 go, of course, uh, Jordan Bubbins knows that that fight isn't worth taking, Jesse. And in these kind of, you know, multi-category races where we've got pro and silver, it's almost like endurance racing it's all about you know picking your fights and, and just minimizing your time loss you know Bubbins doesn't have to fight that car at all and sensibly let bossy tigress go that means of course Bubbins can get back underway try and fend off nindula and villas mass who are behind yeah you got to pick your battles like you say it's very important to know who you're racing against and even more know about who they are as a driver some are a little bit more defensive some are a little bit more aggressive and other drivers are indifferent 
and you just sort of got to know it. And the more you race with a certain group of drivers, the more you understand them. This, of course, being a weekly series, a lot of these drivers know each other anyway by default here at the RCI family. So they will have a better idea and understanding. You go international racing, if you will, the big esports events, maybe that's a little less so. You don't know sort of where their mental attitude is and you kind of have to piece it together as you go. But a lot of these drivers, they already have predetermined notions of, oh, this guy's going to race me hard, or, oh, he'll probably let me go as Kevin Boss's day has gone bad to worse. By the way, we did confirm that it was a start infraction. Oh, and it's a huge crash there into the pink KTM. That wasn't Callum Kerrigan, was it? I think it was Callum Kerrigan. Indeed, very hard impact there from Kevin Boss. That Boston. is friendly fire. Teammate I mean, yeah. on teammate. Those two are friends, aren't they? And, you know, in mm -hmm. kind of outside of the racing circuit, should we say. So Kevin Boss is probably going to be kicking himself there for what he's done. But look like he just skated wide through turn two. Very strange indeed. Caught a lot of understeer out on the marbles. And then, of course, once you're on the marbles, the car just kind of wanders itself off. Tried to get it back on track and, of course, dipping in the grass. Unsettled the car. Fired it back over to driver's right. And, unfortunately, Callum Kerrigan was just coming through the turn. And, uh, unfortunately, collateral damage there, Jesse. Hey, John, uh, I'm going to give it, give you a little quiz here. What kind of car is Kevin Boss driving? It's an Audi. No, it's junk now. <laughs> and that it is, is the long and short of it. Yeah, Kevin Boss just dipping a tire off into the right side was, I, I assume, was trying to afford Kerrigan room or something like that, trying to set Kerrigan up perhaps as well. Just went way too far to the left, entering the S's and ended up dipping the tire into the dirt. That's a very odd incident we don't normally see. And right into one of their good friends, Callum Kerrigan. Double-edged sword crashing into your friends. They're more likely to forgive you, but also uh, you feel worse when you crash the car off into the grass here as they save it just barely and they continue to race on. But it was a scary close moment. Ash Bibby had a momentary look, but ducked back in as Vossi Tigris is pioneering KTM's rally scene right here today. Yeah, maybe a rally raid vehicle coming out of the KTM Expo uh, GT2, but uh, of course, Ash Bibby there getting a fantastic view of the underside of uh, Vossi Tigris' car as it went through the gravel and bounced back up. Uh, Kevin Boss still limping the Audi he around. He's pit. trying to stay out of trouble. I think he's waiting for the pit window, Jesse. Of course, opens in about two minutes' time. So logically, he should be down the lane. Uh, we've got here, this is Christopher Streppen and Andy Boardman. And uh, Kevin Boss oh, there that's heading what way happened. out of the way on no, that one. No, he was one. trying to get a pit lane, and he was ah, stuck possibly. on the outside. Maybe so, yeah. Could could be a good observation there. Or could be, of course, he's just waiting for the he's pit window. He's crashed again. Like he's crashed he again. Is. Kevin Boss has crashed again. Don't have pictures of it, and I wonder if did this involve another car. No, it doesn't. The rear end of Kevin Boss's wheelie slow car is broken, Ooh. and everybody able to scrape their way through. And yeah, the rear end of that car completely destroyed. And when you try to go up the hill like that, it just came around on him. And he was trying to get the pit lane, but he was stuck. And by the time he got clear, it is just a nightmare day here. At Watkins Glen for Boss. Yeah, such a shame as well for Kevin after such a strong start, of course, at Mount Panorama and just kind of gone from bad to worse, should we say, for really slow number 31. But Mike Jones is going to be rubbing his hands with Glee. Of course, he's in P3 currently for the silver class, as we see here. Christopher Streppen sizing up Andy Borman. There's a KTM sized gap. And Christopher Streppen certainly opened it around the outside into the bus stop. That's how that move was made. Andy Boardman has dropped back now. That's going to allow Christopher Streppen out. Meanwhile, Maxime Roland looks like they were trying the outside line through turn nine. Just couldn't get the grip and Grim Lilith will remain in P6. But this is a bit of an awkward one, isn't it, Jesse? When, you know, you're stuck in a fight like this, of course, uh, both cars being the Audi R8 and, you know, one car on controller, one car on, on a steering wheel. It's... It's really hard to try and find that tiny advantage you know, when you're in such equal machinery and you're running such similar pace to the guy ahead of you, especially with the wake, of course, of the dirty air. You know, it really can't make anything work, especially a long circuit here. Like Watkins Glen as uh, Grim Lilith goes a little bit wide in turn one. Roland tucks into the slipstream. Could this be the move going into the bus stop, Jesse? May be. Maxi Roland just is in a difficult spot. I feel like the 29 LP racing car is a little bit quicker but Grimm is just quick enough to 
deep in front without a mistake from Grim Lilith. This is going to be a very hard pass. They had left Kelly a little bit, and they sort of uh, raced amongst themselves at all. No, another whip from the destroyed Kevin Boss car as uh, now they're facing the wrong way, but fortunately they can see the cars coming whenever they whipped it back around. And now the pit cycle is open. They will come in, but that is going to be a lengthy repair. But uh, with the Grim and Roland, that, the, the problem with that is, is that unless Grim makes a mistake, Roland's going to have to do something drastic. And Maxime doesn't want to do that right now. And that sort of builds trust in racing drivers. Jackson making their way back through the field here a little bit as Callum Kerrigan's had a subsequent incident, I'm told. Uh, let's have a look here. Callum Kerrigan out of turn nine, dips a wheel. Uh, just slows up, I think, sensibly there. Uh, just letting the uh, kind of race leader, should we say, go through. Of course, Christopher Streppen, Boardman, Edwards, Huell, and then, of course, Grim Lilith just appearing in the background as well. So just just some heads up driving, I think, there from uh, from the ATM driver, Callum Kerrigan, as we see both the Audis now peeling into the pit lane. Grim Lilith and Maxime Roland both come down the lane to take their and through stop, albeit a little bit early, kind of eight minutes from uh, splitting the race completely down the middle. Uh, meanwhile, Aaron Jackson hassling the back of Miguel Martins, really trying to make that Mercedes work. And Jackson gets a much better run out of the final turn, but is it going to be enough power in the Audi R8 V10 as we come down into turn one? Last of the late breakers, Jackson punches the pedal through the floor, nearly overruns Miguel Martins, tries to do the old up and under through turn one. It's just not on though. Side by side through turn two they go. We know the grunt of the Mercedes will certainly have the Audi as they pull up the hill, but Miguel Martins on the less favoured side of the road Ooh. gets very close to the Armco and and we see in the background in the rear view mirror at the top of course there Miguel Martins there just sizing up Jackson into the bus stop I think Jackson has done just about enough there Jesse that was some fantastic driving and both drivers again trusting each other all the way and Jackson on the warpath coming back through this field for Kaiju racing and your eyes don't deceive you that's an Aldi livery on that uh, Audi it's an Audi Aldi an Aldi Audi and uh, may uh, come as some surprise. Yes, we have Aldi over here. We have all different sorts. And uh, that's no stranger to Americans to see a car like that. I haven't seen a retro Aldi car in quite some time. I think the side paneling of that car has a slogan on it as well. But it's uh, quite an interesting car. I don't know if Jackson is a fan of the grocery store chain or they were just looking to make the pun that's on the door about to have Aldi and more or something is what I think it says on that car. Quite, quite humorous, but not, not humorous is Jackson's run back through this field. Keep in mind, they came from like 15th, 16th position. They've made all this up on the racetrack. Yeah, certainly a very impressive oh, drive. Not like all the like others. All the others, indeed. Very good fun I love there it. from Gaiju, of course. Uh, Aldi Roberts. Sport. Yeah, it's it's full of any Audi logo is now an Aldi logo on the car, so it's uh, oh, great goodness. to see. Uh, but yeah, like you say, the uh, budget supermarket chain featuring very heavily uh, on the uh, livery of Aaron Jackson. And in the UK, we only, have... <laughs> we only have one type of Audi uh, in the UK, of course, uh, around the world. There is Audi North and Audi South. Uh, in the yep. UK, it is just Audi. And we do you know both. why? know why there's an Audi North and Audi South? I, I actually do. It's the same reason we have uh, both in America. One that sells spirits and stuff like that. The other one just does strictly uh, groceries. Yeah, absolutely so. In 1960-ish, uh, uh, there was a dispute between the, uh, the two brothers whether they should sell cigarettes or not. One wanted mm. to sell cigarettes, one didn't, and so the uh, dispute Ooh, was made slide. and they, they parted ways. But yeah, big slide from Parker Olsen. Very well held there from the Tick Gang race against Of course, Paul Fox breathing down their neck, although not for position, Jesse. Uh, again, we've got to bear this in mind. Of course, Olsen is a pro car, kind of mixing it in with the silvers. So the next nearest pro car is their teammate, of course, uh, Tigris, all the way down in P15. Or the next nearest one ahead is Miguel Martins in P9. So uh, Olsen right now, just going to drive to the end, I feel. Yeah, some of these cars getting a little sketchy. We talked a lot about the tires. We haven't seen a whole lot of the tires play into an issue here today, but I wonder now as we approach the halfway point in the race, if that is starting to creep in a little bit. Parker Olsen, part of the Tick Gang group, 
they had a little bit of a slide right there and that tells me that maybe the rears are not quite as sweet as they may have been at the start of the race starting to give up a little bit whenever you press the gas that uncharacteristic for a gt2 a lot of the drivers tell you that yeah they love driving these cars because all you really have to do there's no modulation of the throttle you just mash it and go and it's a fun car to drive but unfortunately when the tires wear you kind of have to go back to figuring out where the sweet spot is on the throttle a little bit especially at a racetrack like this especially in this heat and uh, some of the cars perhaps on that limit of paying for it with uh, their tire life Ordman has fallen back to P3. That happened some time ago, but something else. Ted Edwards, who was way apprehensive, is up into fourth place in this race. Remember, qualified inside the top five. Rafael Huell right behind him with the KTM. They're, of course, fighting over P4. A lot of fights still in this race. Of course, we documented uh, Jackson's tear through the field up into eighth place currently here is Raphael Huell the uh, number 21 KDM working over Ted Edwards for that four spot yeah I say Raphael Huell you know glued to the back of Ted Edwards at the moment after a, a great qualifying from Ted a late game from P9 to P5 for that Audi but you can see they're skating wide in turn 11 the uh, cars of the Audi not looking too happy and maybe the kind of slightly lighter weight of the KTM could possibly assist it in tire longevity come down to turn one of course a much tighter line again from Huel but Edwards gets a nicer drive off the corner almost backing the rear of the Audi into the cabin section and like you said Jesse just kind of punching the throttle to uh, get the car going and you know, GT2 is a, a format most akin to uh, gentleman drivers again it's a uh, kind of more power less downforce so you know, they've really got to be careful though plenty of traction systems uh, traction control and ABS to help them along the way so it's almost like a like a stepping stone isn't it into a, uh, a GT3 car so uh, certainly keeping it very beginner friendly and like you say these cars are quite easy to drive and all position does really matter because you don't want to be punching it too soon of course with the lack of aerodynamics you really struggle to change the car's direction you can see there Ted's kind of very late on the brakes isn't he for most corners he runs quite wide in but then of arcs the corner of jumps on the power a lot earlier but Raphael Huell this time with a much tighter line there's almost a diffuser up the inside of Ted Edwards there but just with enough drive again off the corner the Audi looks like it comes off the corners better but the KTM looks like it goes into them better than the Audi does yeah, the, the differences in these GT2 cars are very pronounced they're very obvious even from our camera lens riding on the splitter of Raphael Huell's car you can see that the complete different characteristics of these cars and th that happens in gt2 and gt or excuse me gt3 and gt4 racing as well but i feel like it's way more pronounced here you can have cars like the mercedes that just rip down the straight but suffer in the corners and with here you're seeing a car that's really good into the corners versus a car really good off of the corner some of that may be a little bit of setup some of that's just the handling of the cars indeed uh, Either Varga has made huge strides in the lead of the Silver Class or Mike Jones has had a little bit of a mistake. That gap was not nearly that big a little while ago, but Jones in 12th place, P2 in their class. Nobody from the top couple of cars in silver have pitted thus far. We saw Maxine Roland and Grib Lilla come in from the pro class. We've had Racer, Fox, and Teixeira come into the pit lane. Dillis Moss has just exited for the silver class, but Varga Jones and Withel, Bibby and Bubbins have not come in for their stop, nor has Daly and Vestrepin out in front of the pro field. Everybody's sitting and waiting. I reckon most of them just waiting for the exact middle point, which would have been their strategy anyway. And as you can see, pit lane, as we approach the halfway point, very busy place. Yeah, certainly getting very busy indeed. Miguel Martins down the lane. Olsen, Vivian, Bubbins like you say. Christopher Streppen has just managed to come out ahead there. The orange KTM at the top of the hill you just saw in the back of the shot. Uh, so they're going to be in to some clean air. The 747 uh, looks at the crack map right-hand side. Uh, top position, 12 o'clock. Look at the free air that Christopher Streppen has right now. So that's an ideal place to come out for the 747. Meanwhile, Kerrigan and Boss saw a little bit of action there on the track. They're trying to fight back. And uh, there's Stevenson as well. 
got caught up in the earlier on incident. But meanwhile, Andy Borman and Jordan Daly both down pit lane and Ted Edwards in as well. That releases, of course, Raphael Huell to go another lap. So I imagine Huell be in next lap as well, Jesse. Yeah, I wonder if that will be the case. You don't want to be out there too long because you can get jumped or in Rafael Hill's case, you could fall further behind. I think Daly, Boardman, Edwards and Kelly coming in. I think that's a brilliant strategy. I think that's the obvious strategy as well. But I think the situation calls for that. Hill goes long. We've seen Rafael do that before where they will go long. Sometimes they come in a lap later or so. Sometimes they go quite a distance further. In this case, the pit window, they only can go nine more minutes. I just feel like staying out there would be incredibly detrimental to them. Ash Bibby, it's gone wrong for the 699 SJ and H car. They have received a stop and go 30 for speeding in the pit lane. Meanwhile, as uh, Varga has come to pit lane, that has given the lead to Mike Jones, who has some fans in our chat here today. Let's go, Mike Jones. Yeah, certainly Mike Jones uh, fan club in the chat at the moment. But uh, yeah, great to see, of course, teammates uh, kind of supporting each other along their endeavors. But of course, uh, we'll see two of those cars uh, hopefully next week, judging by the uh, last message in the chat, Jesse. Of course, uh, I'll make tonight due to work commitments. But uh, of course, next week onwards, uh, we should see them as well on the grid. Christopher Strappen and Andy Borman have come out quite a way apart here. Uh, this is uh, Peace. Seven for Boardman and uh, six for Verstappen just up the road, of course. Uh, wait for the timing gate to update, and it does so, of course. Bus stop, Jordan Daly, still your provisional race leader. 4.1 seconds to the good on Christoph Verstappen. And it's going to be quite a big ask, uh, ask, I feel, for the number 747 driver. It really is. My apologies, by the way, a correction. I thought I saw Vargas' car down the lane a lap or so ago. That's not the case. Vargas still leading in the silver class, but way up the pylon. They disappeared off of my timing and scoring. They were so far up. I thought I saw that particular liveried car down the lane. Wasn't the case. Need to get my eyes checked. Varga still out there without making a stop. They're the only silver car who has not made their stop. Got Huell, Jackson, Varga, Tigris, the only cars that have not made their stop inside the top 10. And then you've got Norris back in 12 to was involved in the earlier scuffle. Bibby has three laps, by the way, to serve that stop and go 30 for speeding in the pit lane. They've done it here. Now, I don't know how big of an issue this is in GT racing. It probably isn't as battle here for 18th place. Morph going around the outside of Jordan Bubbins makes that look very academic indeed. But in, in other forms of racing, especially races where you don't have a pit limiter, because of the downhill nature of pit lane here at the Glen, it's a bit of a problem to maintain your speed because even if you're just rolling, they obviously going downhill has given you more momentum. So it's easy to overspeed in pit lane. Not really a problem in cars with modern uh, uh, pit limit, but of course still could be a problem if you roll before your limiter is on. You can get up the speed quite quickly. Yeah, gravity is a wonderful thing, isn't it, Jesse? And, you know, even cast your mind back, like you say, those years ago when they never had pit limiters and even pit speed limits some in some series weren't a thing back in the day. You look at historic racing clips and pit lanes are absolutely crowded and cars are going through at, you know, breakneck speeds compared to, to what we're doing now. You know, we're doing a slow pace through the uh, through the lane compared to what they used to do. So, you know, it's still very easy to, to get it wrong, even in the um, even in the modern day machines with like you say, the pit limiter on a button that kind of aids you as you come down the pit lane. You know, you can't, no matter how far you plant your throttle into the floor, it will not overspeed past the uh, 48, 49 kilometers an hour that is set. And, uh, you know, it's mainly done on pit entry, isn't it, Jesse? You know, drivers trying to make the absolute maximum as uh, speaking of pit entry, of course, Raphael Huell and Norris both down the lane this time by Peter Varga as well has chosen to come down the lane. So I can only assume Tigris will also follow suit or if they do want to uh, provisionally lead a race they might go through for a, another lap but back to the point in question uh, of course uh, it's always done on pit entry isn't it it's done you know drivers coming into the lane particularly where ted edwards is now of course you're trying to maximize your speed through the corner trying to keep it as low as you can obviously towards the uh, right hand side down on the brakes in just about enough time to uh, to draw it up in time to hit that button and to engage the pit limiter before the white line and of course before your back wheels cross the white line 
is the uh, crucial part, but it's just so easy to overcook when you're trying to make up, you know, the difference between seconds or, you know, milliseconds sometimes, but every everybody's a racing driver here. They all want to maximize as much time as they can out of any single aspect of racing. You know, if you took the bollards out of the bus stop and said, you can cut it all you want, I'm sure drivers would definitely attempt it, even in these, like, stiffly sprung race cars. So, uh, you know, it's just one of those things, isn't it? It's, it's racing drivers' prerogative to try and come into pit lane as fast as they can. Well, here, of course, are the pit stop times for the cars that have done their official pit stop. Tigers doesn't have a time. That's because they're in the lane now. Jordan Daly did a 106.798. Now that starts and they break the timing beam entering from the time where they break the exit beam when they re-enter the track. So that includes the travel time and the stop itself. So a 106.798, pretty darn good. Vestrepin had a slower stop of 7.2, a 7.6, back to Andy Boardman in third, a 6.6. .6. For Raphael Huell. Now that was a really good stop. That has slotted them quite nicely and comfortably up into P4. A slow stop for Ted Edwards, a 109 1, and that has dropped them by proxy back to fifth place. So Huell and Edwards were in a fight for that spot prior to the stop, but the slow stop for Edwards, I assume, had a minimal amount of damage on that car, and they repaired it whether they meant to or not. That's by the by. Slower stop has changed the position there. 6-3 for Grim Lilith, 6-1 for Roland, and that has reignited this fight for sixth place. As you go further back, slower stops, of course, indicative of repairing damage or being impeded down the lane. You know, John, we talk a lot about pit lane and speeding in it and how frustrating that can be. The downhill nature doesn't help, but also, too, the other thing that nobody talks about, there's multiple lines on pit entry, and if that board is gone, that 50-kilometer board, isn't there? What line do you use? NASCAR uses a different line from IndyCar. IndyCar uses a different line from GT World Challenge. So if you don't have the board, what line is the actual one you need to be at the limit on? And that yeah, in lies the problem. Yeah, you've really got to rehearse your pit stops, haven't you? You know, in the realm of GT racing, you know, that board is, is the all important magical marker, should we say, uh, where drivers really push the limit. And you know, certain tracks, Barcelona naming one, that's quite close. To the uh the, the narrow kind of tunnel as you come down the pit lane so that often gets knocked off i've seen valencia uh be knocked off as well monza uh, another one in my head that i can i can recall that i've seen missing in another race that i've casted in the past so you know these things happen purely by accident as we see from lilith completely Man. drifting the audi r8 there ahead riding on board currently with uh, maxime roland and Roland's probably thinking, yes, Grim, let's do some more of that. Wear down your Pirellis, overheat them ever so slightly, and maybe I can get past you for that sixth position. But uh, yeah, the, the board is the all-important magical marker, isn't it? As soon as it's kind of disappeared, drivers become a bit panicky, a bit hasty. You see some drivers kind of checking up really early. You see drivers, you know, very confident in where they think the line is. They're blasting past it, and then all of a sudden they've got a, a driving a drive-through or stop-and-go penalty. So, you know... It, anything can happen during these pit stops and you know it, it's a test of your knowledge isn't it of circuits coming into the lane and going oh the board's missing where's where's the limit like you say you know nascar indycar use two different things uh gt world challenge again could be slightly different it's it's so frustrating for a racing driver trying to remember every single piece of knowledge and then you have to sh you know account for the pit board where was that last time i came down the lane and now, I always say this when we talk about pit stops, but Wolf Matushka, you've been in practice sessions with Wolf. You've watched him circulate for, you know, the hour session that we, we sometimes hold. And, you know, 40, 40 minutes of that almost is spent by Wolf just coming in, finding the limit, going back out, pushing the limit a bit more, coming in and, and literally rinse and repeat until he knows exactly where that board is, how late he can break. And often Wolf is the fastest car in and off, you know, in and out of pit lane. I've seen him advocate for that in side teams he's raced with. Is uh, yeah, just give it a couple of goes. Make sure you know where it is. Get a feel for how fast you can enter the pit lane because the easiest way to overtake somebody is not on the racetrack. It's in the pit lane. 
and I've seen him change the mood of a room by saying, yeah, let, do, do some do some practice at the end of your session. And everyone going, oh, yeah, that probably is a really good idea. A huge slide there from Teixeira. He's able to save it, but he's going to be forced wide here. Gore Fox going up the inside of the essence. This should be all but done and dusted. But no, fighting back down the inside is Teixeira. They're still side by side as they exit the essence and down the back straight. They're going to be neck and neck, but around the outside. Teixeira closes the door again, but the speed of Gore Fox is KTM down into the corner. It's a huge breaking zone, and Fox has done it. But that was an excellent series of corners by both drivers, giving each other excellent room, affording some wonderful racing. I didn't think that Porsche was going to pull back in front, but it did briefly. But I reckon maybe Teixeira said it's not worth it. Just let them go. Yeah, I mean, Teixeira, you know, he's a sensible racer, knew exactly, you know, the Porsche isn't the strongest car in the GT2 field, had a little bit of a battle, had his fun, and then like you say, Jesse, just kind of pulled the plug before it got a little bit too dangerous going side by side into the bus stop. Meanwhile, Aaron Ooh. Jackson up the inside of Miguel Martins, jumps over the curb on the inside. It's a, a bit of a lethal curb here at Watkins Glen on that turn one. It's got a little bit of a lip, a flat lip that you can nicely kiss, but you go a little bit further, it's almost like a speed hump in the curb. It rises up really drastically and it can, you know, can unsettle the car you know, to no end on your fast lap, let alone when you're going side by side into the corner with someone. So Aaron Jackson there, very controlled after he hit the bump, avoided Miguel Martin's door, and the two will race on into the last 20 or so minutes. Maxime Roland for the uh, drift competition there, going through uh, turn eight, I believe that is, coming uh, through over the top of the hill, but still behind Grim Lilith. This has been a bit of a, a stale fight almost, isn't it, Jesse? You know, you said earlier on in the broadcast that you know, Roland's probably just kind of biding their time, figuring out where Grim is strong, where they're weak, where they can make a move, work together for the first half of the race or so. But of course, the clock is ticking. We're under 20 minutes to go now. Roland's going to have to get a move on if they want to pass Grim. And an incredibly respectful fight, I will say, between Lilith and Roland. And they just need to keep that up for another 18 minutes. But you wonder, does Maxine's patience start to wear thin as they've been behind the same car for predominantly the entire race right behind them is this fight the dcc motorsport 62 of miguel martin's under attack from Aaron jackson who lost a couple of spots there on pit road didn't see anything too crazy on the pit stop just looks like they've got out strategized a little bit maybe but they lost some of that progress that they had gained back down to 10th place they still have the speed in that aldi aldi and they're trying to make back up a spot on Miguel Martins for a second time. You know, it's hard to pass a car once, John Dalton. It's even harder to do it twice. Yeah, you almost think you know well, what you can do, don't you? As you say that, Miguel Martins. Say that. <laughs> exactly. Curse of the commentator overruns turn one and uh, respectfully probably backs out the throttle, allows Aaron Jackson to uh, go back through. But, you know, we know the Mercedes is quite quick on a straight, so possibly Miguel Martins might have retaliation in a few laps' time if uh, it all goes their way. Meanwhile, on board, Maxime Ro Roland, traffic giveth and traffic taketh away there. Uh, that's one of the uh, Maseratis, the number 14, I believe, of Indula, uh, currently down in P22, just at the bottom of the timing gate there, and staying way out of the way, almost picking the uh, racing line, and then, of course, pulling over to the right-hand side, seeing the uh, battle ensuing behind thing. I want no further part of this, but in the mirror, of course, Maxime Roland is still Robbie Kelly. Again, these guys have been in a, a bit of a three-way fight for the majority of the race but still no move to be had and really hustling the Audi through these turns and maybe Maxime Roland when they backed out the move going into the bus stop about 20 or so minutes ago uh, maybe they should have maybe kept the foot in it Jesse and they could have been past Grimm and maybe up the road a little bit but the dirty air of course at the Audi ahead isn't going to be helping the uh, handling characteristics of the LP Racing number 29 of course the more they scrub these tyres the or they're going to wear them down, heat them up, and then, of course, they're not going to be that magical peak window that we all know Pirelli's love to be in. Certainly the case. I'm going to say something incredibly disrespectful. Looking at the front of Grimm's car for the past two weeks, I've been reminded of something. Grimm's car from the front, it's very clearly an Audi, but from the front, it looks exactly, because of the paint scheme on it, Grimm's car looks exactly like a Renault RS race car. And I know that's disrespectful. I apologize to both brands, but that's what it looks like to me. Because of the way the stripes are, it looks like the way that the RS is, it has like mascara on the top of the uh, the headlights, and it makes that Audi look like a Renault 
just a little bit. And if you see it, you can't unsee it. But either way, that's uh, what it looks like. Grimm's just doing such a good job, though, of keeping Maxine Roland behind. But here comes Robbie Kelly. This three-way fight that we've had all race has come back together again. Grimm proving just a too tall of a mountain to climb thus far in the race. But with 15 minutes to go, you have to wonder, do you force a move? And if so, in. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? It's going to be half the going to have to be a, a slightly forceful but respectful move I would say I think Maxime Roland has been very patient in the way they've, they've operated through the last 45 minutes or so of course under 15 minutes to go now so maximum you've got seven or eight laps depending of course when the uh, race leader passes the line so you have to get a move on and you see all the time in the high downfalls corners that Maxime Roland's car just doesn't behave the same way as Grimm's car does there Grimm pulling out a little bit of an advantage in all these fast corners and a bit of dirty air, of course, isn't going to be helping the number 29 to convey to the front. Meanwhile, speaking of the front, Jordan Daly, of course, your race leader. Remember when the pit stops uh, cycle round, Jesse, 4.2 seconds or so to the good for Christopher Schreppen. It's down to 2.1 seconds now between the number 197 and the 747. Could we see a very late contention from Christopher Schreppen on the race leader as Maxime Roland still in the wake of Grim Lilith, the 115. You see every time jesse down the back straight just lifting ever so slightly off the throttle just drawing back from grim Lillis rear bumper allowing them through the bus stop single file but of course they can use that slip through jesse they could get a run alongside make it awkward into the bus stop but i know grim i don't think either of these two would back out of a move into the bus stop i reckon they try and take it side by side through the inner loop no, I, I mean to not assume that maxi roland is just going to drive behind him all race that that's not to what racing is really he's looking for an opportunity and he may have found it right here up the inside Grim slides the car in tow which is turn number seven and it's allowed roll on up the inside and he's going to get the move done on the exit nobody else squeaks through Kelly's going to have to wait their turn but at long last nearly 40 minutes of trying the number 29 LP racing Audi has made the pass and is up into P6 yeah, we're going to have to keep an eye on this gap, aren't we, just to see what happens. Meanwhile, the number 65, that's uh, Jordan Bubbins, just noticed a yellow flag in turn one, immediately straight back to the pit lane very quickly indeed. Uh, have a look what happened here. Uh, nice nice replay coming down on the brakes, and of course, the grass inches Whoa! in, Jesse. And that's a very big one indeed, almost akin to the uh, NASCAR brake failures that we used to see. Jimmy kind of Johnson the, did yeah. exactly that in, like, 2002 in a nascar uh, uh national series race denny hamlin did that in a cup race and i think 2011 as well and that is exactly right you've nailed it that looks exactly like a brake failure yeah not sure if bobbins caught the grass and threw the car off and just knew that it wasn't going to stop before he reached the barrier or like you say maybe a brake failure of some kind possibly in uh the hardware of course no uh, mechanical failures as such in acc and in theory jesse providing he's chosen the right set of pads for the race he shouldn't be out of brake pads either and uh, logically the ducks are going to be open enough to be able to go for the hour so again brakes probably haven't overheated so either caught the grass and, and just knew he wasn't going to draw up in time or possibly the brake pedal on his rig just not responding imsa i believe and this is a foggy memory but i'm pretty sure a few years ago a Porsche in an IMSA series went through the fence in turn one. It hopped the fence, it was on the wall, and it catapulted over the fence and landed on the other side, or maybe it was caught by the fence. Uh, it's a dangerous corner. It's downhill all the way. The camera doesn't really do it justice. It is a drop into turn number one, and if you hit your braking wrong, it's bad enough. That's why all that runoff area is paved now. And it used to be a gravel trap, as I recall, but the reason it's paved is it's trying to give you an opportunity to save it. But if you have a brake failure, some sort of uh, hardware failure, like we presume him to have had in that incident, then there's nothing you can do. You're going hard into that tire pack. And some days you're just happy it's a sim. That's certainly one of them. It's a scary incident. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm just watching back some old NASCAR clips now. Uh, it was 2000s, uh, I believe, when uh, one of the NASCARs did uh, skip through the number eight. Uh, straight Jimmy Johnson, yeah. Yeah, Jimmy. straight into the polystyrene wall. Nice and he got out of the, the car uh, and like, celebrated 
on yeah. top of it as well. That was insane. That was my introduction to Jimmy Johnson. Didn't know who he was. Of course, he's a seven-time NASCAR champion, Hall of Famer. But uh, back then, he was nobody. He was coming up through the ranks, and he had that failure happen. And that was most people's introduction. Scary accident. What does he do? Gets out of the car, stands on top of it, goes, woo, and yeah. walks away. Double, double punches the air and then yeah, yeah. Just walks away. So, yeah, an absolutely kind of badass move there from Jimmy Johnson. Yeah, certainly very scary indeed. And like you say, it's all all paved now. You know, it was gravel back in the day, which probably didn't help matters. But certainly with modern cars, modern braking, it's uh, get the cars drawn up and reach the, uh, the wall nowadays. Meanwhile, back to the uh, the fight at hand. Of course, Robbie Kelly now on the back of Grim Lilith. Oh, a fantastic man. view this time from the back of Maxime Roland's car. Both cars with a big twitch coming off turn seven there. Robbie Kelly tucking in the slipstream, just darting out, seeing if they can make a move down the inside, but just not alongside enough of the 115 to uh, disturb them on the racing line to get the overlap and, of course, force Grim Lilith around the wider line. But Robbie Kelly only looking very racy indeed. And course cast your mind back just weeks ago when we were at indianapolis jesse uh porsche cayman in the gt4 uh, tcx series robbie kelly very fast in that one as well so sure gonna try and get past grim lilith the grim's car is just not handling very well right now it's uh, giving up grip i wonder if maybe they punish the tires a little bit too much they're sliding off some of these low speed corners trying to get back to acceleration and that's not going to help here because that all that does is force you wider and the more you try and hold on the worse it becomes the more overheated the tires become the less grip you have the more wide you push more opportunity that the tick gang 25 has to make this pass this could be very unfortunate for grim who drove all the way up there into sixth place could be demoted as low as eighth place by the way of course jackson's behind this group by some distance they have dispatched of martins at least and oh my goodness a little bit of a mistake there a little bit of a mistake from maxine Roland and grim lilith has gone back through that's going to be super frustrating for maxine Roland. and now robbie kelly is even trying to have a sniff at the inside of the number 29 LP racing machine, but managing to fend them off in to turn six very nicely. And now Roland is oh, it's a move. another crack at it, starting out in to turn seven. Both cars sliding through the corner, and he knows he's done it there once before. He's going to try it again, but Robbie Kelly looks like they've got a much cleaner run through the corner. Robbie Kelly could possibly do the double up the inside of Grim Lilith. Last of the late oh, it's a touch. Roland with a little bit of a bump sends him into the side of Grim Lilith. Grim goes very wide, manages Huge to hold slide. on to the Audi R8 and pulls back in front of Roland. I think Roland knew they had done wrong there, Jesse. Just backed out of it very sensibly. And Robbie Kelly, the big gainer here. Let's have a look at the steering wheel control from Grim. Opposite lock, straightened it. Opposite lock, still opposite lock. Straightens it up again and gets it back underway behind Robbie Kelly. But very scary moment indeed for Grim. Smoked rear tires right there. Both of the rear tires lit up, laid black marks down on the racetrack. Again, that's not going to help the tire situation of Grim Lilith there. But Robbie Kelly has gone from eighth. They played the patient game all race long. They're up into P6. Now they're driving away and allowing Lilith and Roland to continue their fight that they've had for the majority of the race. But that was great sportsmanship by Maxime right there. I wouldn't expect anything less out of these two. The way that they've raced each other with respect all race. One little touch like that. They're not going to throw all of that rapport out of the window. The frustrating thing though for Grimm is that the tires certainly now are starting to scream a little bit harder, a little bit more the silver lining, six and a half minutes left, but will the car hang on for that amount of time? But Robbie Kelly released from this group. He, he's, he's, he's gone over a second ahead now. Yeah, absolutely. Got out of the way, hasn't he? I mean, much like Christopher Streppen, when uh, he got released, of course, from Andy Gorman, he managed to pull out a very nice lead as well. And up then, Christopher Streppen, 2.6 seconds now. Roland with a big slide through the turn they're all handling bad the now John. All, yeah the audis are really screaming at the moment aren't they you can really see the difference uh, in cornering between the audis and the maseratis and of course jordan daly the lead car is an audi as well but i think he certainly looked after his tires just about enough just under six minutes to go jesse and make that possibly about three or four more laps by quick calculations and uh christopher strepin there in the background we've got uh, one of the maseratis uh, i think that's uh, Ellie, is it? That's uh, Norris, sorry. Uh, the number 48 going very wide at turn one. And 
quite surprised at the moment, Jazzy. Nobody picking up the track limits. Touch wood. Oh dear. Drive through uh, penalty. See, Curse of the commentator uh, about to strike. Yeah. See, I was gonna, I was gonna take that from you, John. I was gonna say that so you didn't have to be that guy. But I was just gonna mention that it is suspicious. We've made it this entire race. Five minutes left to go. Not a single track limit warning. Every penalty that we've had has been issued via speeding in the pit lane or out of uh, position on the initial start of the race. As far as we know, we've not received drive-throughs from anybody for pits, or not, excuse me, for uh, track limits warnings. It's not impossible to get here. It is hard to get one without damaging the car, though. Normally, if you're picking up track limits here, you're already in the wall. Of course, the bus stop, one of the caveats to that, you can get a double penalty there by cutting the entry and then going wide in the middle bit and it will double up your track limit warning. So instead of getting one, you can get two. Obviously, you can only have three. For a fourth, you get a penalty. So that is somewhat common. I haven't seen that today. Daily out in front of the field, controlled this entire race for SJNH Racing. 197 has done a great job. They were quickest in practice. They were quickest in qualifying, and they've kept their friend and teammate, Christoph Estrepa, just behind them this entire race. It was as much as four seconds. After the pit stop, it was under three. The Streppens worked it to around two seconds, but just keeping just enough gap, managing the race, that is the sign of a pro race car driver. And the Streppen knows that, and they're digging a little bit. They're trying to chip away at it. Of course, Restrepa knows all it takes, one back marker to get in the way, one little mistake, and he's right there. Yeah, that's absolutely right, isn't it? I mean, two seconds. A fairly sizable gap in racing as we see Guel Fox with a rally cross moment nice through save. the inner loop. That's going to mean Jordan Daly is going to catch that car even quicker now. But hopefully that means that, of course, Guel Fox will be in single file as opposed to fighting with Keith Withel double file on the race. A flash of the lights there from Daly as they come through the corner and Guel Fox giving up the inside line. Maybe not signaling all too clearly. Of course, the KTM rear lights aren't always the clearest when you're catching them in a little hop there in the background for Christopher Streppen using the curve to try and maximize as much as they can on track usage. Um, last time by, it was a 146.2 for Jordan Daly, a 145.8 for Christopher Streppen. So a slightly a slight gain there for the uh, Belgian driver in second position. Of course, uh, best laps are 144.8 for Daly, 145.2 for Verstappen. So again, the, the ultimate best lap, Daly again, is the quicker car on the circuit. So it's going to be about consistency now for the last couple of laps. Can Daly keep him honest enough? Can Verstappen cut through this traffic quick enough to try and catch the back of the Audi? As we see ahead there, Keith Withel playing a part in the lead fight this time. Jordan Daly having to follow him through the final turn before pulling out on the main straight go past before turn one and of course Christoph has yet to catch these guys and well Fox certainly looks like the uh, quicker of the two cars again closing up that gap 0.792 and for Strappen wide at turn one trying to uh, maybe take advantage maybe he's got a few in the pocket Jesse of uh, track cuts maybe he hasn't used any yet maybe this could be a tactical decision to see if they can catch daily yeah, hey, if you got him, smoke him, right? And that's kind of what's going on here. You're not going to catch him by just running and doing exactly what he's doing. If you got extra track limit to warnings, use them up here. Try and get close. The traffic not helping daily in any way. Heavy traffic for Verstappen. It's all about how you catch it. It's about what you do with it. It certainly closed that gap. It's under one and a half seconds now. First to second place. Bubbins has joined us in chat to confirm that, John, you were correct that they just misplaced their breaking uh, point. They got off into the grass and it was over from there, hard into the wall. Chin up Bubbins, good luck next time out. That's a very common issue to have. So don't uh, be too harsh on yourself. Meanwhile, the fight for the lead may be on. The fight for seventh place still on between Lilith and Roland. Now they were fighting for sixth. They're fighting for seventh now as Kelly has disappeared off over the horizon. But now it's more about pride. Who will be laughing when the race is over with? This has been such a good fight all day long. Both cars could use a little extra grip. They just don't have it, but they're still fighting on a huge slide there from Maxine trying to get it back under control and continue the fight. They're using it all up here at the end of this one. 
Yeah, it's so tricky, isn't it? I mean, you know, you've given it everything for the last 59 minutes and there's still a minute on the clock. You're still not ahead of that guy that you've been, you know, watching the back end of for the one hour, trying to be respectful in it. You kind of think, you know, what could I have done earlier? Maybe I could have got past Grimm, you know, 30 minutes ago and could have been up with Robbie Kelly fighting for another position. But of course, Kelly tactically taking advantage of the low grip of the Audis and managing to uh -oh. get underway. Now, this is the battle on the cards. Coming though. to the Jordan checkered Daly, flag. Christoph Verstrappen. Verstrappen is all over the grass. Oh, trying to the make absolute the most of the bus stop, the inner loop. This is crazy as we ride on board now. Final lap oh, on my, the screen for Verstrappen, wide. but he's very wide coming out of turn, uh, turn five, I believe, on that one. But Jordan Daly. Could be panicking, he could be sweating, but for Strappen, <laughs> big sideways moment. He's really pushing the KTM. He's wringing the neck of the GT2, trying to get it as close as he can to Jordan Daly. Put as much pressure on the Englishman ahead, but I think too little too late for Verstrappen I don't think he's got it in the tank Jesse a few more corners to go a flash of the lights probably to say GG's well done for fending me off but that was fantastic run through the bus stop that was excellent Daly had a slow lap a lap ago and that was partly to traffic that could have been going wide a little bit and that allowed Verstrappen to get an excellent run through the S's and down the back straight into the bus stop and he was right there had Daly not made the carousel like he did he was all the way defensive down to the inside of the carousel turn number five Verstrappen might have had a look down the inside but unable to do that defensive driving when it counted for Daly and he's going to walk it off in grand slam fashion Jordan Daly quickest in all the sessions and wins the race Verstrappen P2 Andy Boardman will come home third as everybody behind them finishing as well behind Boardman it's Yule Ted Edwards inside the top five Kelly will finish in sixth Lilith and Roland not come across yet but they are neck and neck oh Ted Edwards uh, did he make it to the line I don't think he made it to the line he didn't he hasn't lost a spot yet I don't think he no, had he quite hasn't. the gap back to sixth. <laughs> but I wonder if he misunderstood where the line was or just lit up the tires too much neither besides Maxine Roland comes home in eighth that puts Grimm in seventh place settling that battle that has occurred all the race long. Peter Varga, one of the last cars to come across the line, or will be anyway, will win the race in silver class. He seemed confident talking to us pre-race, and why not? The Team Monkey Racing 508 is going to win it in the silver class. Yeah, honorable drive there from Peter Varga. Seemed very confident, like we said in the pre-show, and uh, managed to keep it out of the wreck through turns three and four to take your silver victory. Uh, Ted Edwards, I think, got a bit too premature on the celebration, Jesse. He uh, came out of the final corner, loads of opposite lock, trying to style it out for the crowd and uh, overcooked it into the wall, bounced off one, bounced off the inside and found himself precariously parked next to the pit wall as uh, Mike Jones now comes across the line. He'll be second in silver. That's going to do wonders for his championship contention. And Olsen, your last car to cross the line just behind in the back of the shot. But yeah, Ted Edwards overcooking the celebration ever so slightly. And uh, if Robbie Kelly was that little bit closer, we saw him come through in the back of the shot just as Ted got underway again. Could have maybe been a late P5 from Kelly, but nonetheless, still good for both drivers. Here are your results from Watkins Glen today. Jordan Daly over for Streppen and Boardman. Your podium in pro and in silver. Peter Varga wins it over Mike Jones continuing their excellent drive as well. Keith Withel gets third place in the silver category. The, less, the rest of the results scrolling on your screen. Just a couple of DNFs here today. I think about three or four. Those all due to incidents out there on the racetrack. Kellen Kerrigan and Kevin Boss, who had that horrific incident in the S's, they are the last couple of cars to finish, but perhaps more importantly to them, they did indeed finish. Well, let's talk to our winner in the silver class. Peter Varga joins us. You were confident talking to us pre-race, Peter, but now you've won the race. How do you feel? I feel victorious. <laughs> well, you, you certainly should. You've driven the Maserati. You won the race. And beyond that, too, you survived the cataclysmic event that happened in the S's. How'd you do it? I don't know, man. Just so, you know, 
you you read, you read the previous briefing you see there is a danger slow down take it uh, easy i just saw like uh oh, Carl, I had, okay something going to happen then i just see car on the right all of a sudden i see two cars on the left or also, all of a sudden i see cars everywhere i'm like <laughs> well, what the fuck? what what am i supposed to do well well you i somehow to... got lucky and nobody collected me <laughs> you came in today you were fifth in the championship uh Bathurst was an up and down round, but today you solidify yourself as a championship contender. Do you think you can take the title? Yes. Simple answer. <laughs> yes, I love the confidence. We talked about in the broadcast that you talked to us pre-race and that you were very confident today, and you've absolutely backed that up. You're back in the proverbial and literal driver's seat for this. Uh, what's the outlook for Silverstone? How do you feel about that track? Quite good, I would say. In GT3, Silverstone is alright. Uh, I'm probably not the best around it, but I can enjoy it, so it could be quite fine for the Maserati. But we'll see about the Mercedes guys. They might be a little bit stronger. But overall, to, for today, it was really good. I'm very funny how, in a crash, I passed two Silvers, and then just two Silvers coming past me on the straight. Oh. And the thing is, one of them was the Mercedes of uh, Ibiza Racer. I was questioning whether it's going to be an easy pass, knowing how fast the Mercedes is in a straight line, but luckily the cornering of the Maserati was there with me. Well, there you have it. Uh, Peter, anybody you want to shout out, say hello or thanks to? I want to thanks to my mom, to my dad, uh, to my psychologist, and to the bus driver that uh, took me to school and all of that managed to bring me to here. Let's go. We love to hear it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Varga, your winner here at Watkins Glen in the silver class. Well, I got to say, John, uh, he called the shot, didn't he? Peter did not mince their words. They knew they were going to have a shot here today. They executed their plan when everybody else struggled. This, of course, we're watching the replay, the highlights. This is where it all kicked off. Les Stevenson was leading the race and uh, incident forms and everybody in the middle part of the pack scatters. Varga emerges in P2. He's able to catch Ibiza Racer and get the job done in the end. Yeah, so a little bit of chaos in in the uh, in the middle stint there, should we say? And it, you know, the race start was far too clean, and of course, the big one did eventually happen. But you know, drivers escaping through, and of course, Varga managed to get through, and like you say, kind of got him to the race win. Of course, Les Stevenson was looking very confident coming into this round, but it all kind of unraveled uh, in that kind of top end of the circuit, should we say? But uh, fantastic racing, nonetheless. Of course, highlights have been playing. Uh, just behind you but uh you know some strong finishes some uh, people finishing you know like jordan daly for example didn't finish bar first so again the uh big hall of points coming in today like you say matching at uh, christoph's kind of opening round at mount panorama but again it, it's going to be a big ask of course missing out on the uh, first round of points and daily do it come the end of the season of course we've got this championship uh, going all the way through to uh, the beginning of May. So if you do want to get involved and you do like what you've seen here tonight, of course, head on over to the website racerci.com. Pretty sure there is a sign-up still available for this one if you fancy a mid-season sign-up yourself. Yes, indeed. Of course, we'll be live tomorrow for the 12-hour of Paul Ricard, part of the RCI World Tour 2024. Start your day off with John Dalton and Mitch Hobbs. I believe Stewie's going to bring you the pictures of the start. We'll finish the race, uh, give interviews post-race as well for the final four hours. It's going to be an action-packed day there as well. Many championships besides get involved in sign-ups for Team Jag versus V12. That's right, it's a Jaguar and Aston V12 only championship where you'll be fighting for not only overall glory, but for your represented manufacturer. That's the new Hyundai champ. That championship open to sign up right now. First race is in Suzuka on the 28th. We've got the 12 hour of the Nordschleife. It's the multi, multi, multi class race. Literally bring any car. All the classes are permitted and enjoy that. As far as I'm told, we will accommodate as many cars that show up in each class. So if there's 150 cars that show up, then we're having a 150 car race around 
the Nurburgring 24 hour variant. That race on the 27th of April. Of course, the Friday champ in full swing, and you can join us for round number three at Silverstone next week. All you need to do is sign up. If iRacing's more your thing, IMSA season two is live. We'll be live at Spa this coming Thursday. Midweek Masters closes up this week at Paul Ricard. And of course, World Tour already mentioned is going to be really fun this weekend. Well, what is today's race done for the championship points? Well, it's knotted it up by virtue of the drop round. Both championships, pro and silver, are tied. 72 points apiece for Verstappen and Daly in pro, seven or 65 points apiece in silver for Varga and Boss. It's a close one as we near the midway point of the championship. John, thanks for being with us today. Yeah, it's been brilliant again. I mean, wasn't expected to uh, make the cast tonight, but uh, managed to step in, and I'm glad I did because some fantastic racing on our, our RCI TV tonight, should we say, of course, uh, between everybody in the GT2 category and, of course, seeing some highlights of it currently going around. Definitely one to watch back. Chaotic in the middle and uh, a last-minute fight to boot as well. Just kept it that uh, all important kind of uh, that perfect level of spice should we say jesse sure thing big thanks to our partners that make this race and every race possible aka esports driver 61 fanatec digital motorsport.com and go setups no doubt no shortage of go setups in action here tonight as well but a big thank you to them we couldn't do it without them and we appreciate their help. Jordan Daly holds off for Streppen and wins it in pro. Varga cruises in the silver category and a chaotic but fascinating day of racing here in upstate New York. What will happen when we go back to Old Blighty next week? You'll have to tune in to find out. Like, subscribe, and we'll see you there. On behalf of everyone here at RCI, I've been Jesse Lee, joined by John Dalton with Stewie behind the cameras. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, have a good night.